my cell phone out and I thought this might be a good time to remind you all that during the message you should turn your cell phones off or at least take the volume down which was what I was just doing so well this morning we're going to continue in uh, the series on the holiness of God Last week we looked at what does it mean that God is holy and I told you that it means that he is unique or separate and as the creator he is separate from his creation. He is the source of all that is. He is so far above us. Uh, He is not just true but he is the source of truth. He is not just love or loving but he is the source of love. He is not just righteous, but he is the definer of righteousness. In him there is no sin at all. And so we looked at God and what does it mean that he is holy. Then we looked at what does it mean that you and I are holy. And it's similar, but it's a little different. We are chosen by God and we are set apart and separated out of the world for God. That's what it means for us to be holy We are both called holy initially. It's not really anything about our moral status, but it does eventually move into that. We are called holy by God simply because he's chosen us and separated us, but then we are called to be holy, which means to uh, emulate his character and his righteousness. What I'm going to talk about this morning is sort of a continuation of that theme but it's what R.C. Sproul calls the trauma of holiness. Now there's a lot of talk about trauma in the world today and how terrible it is, but there is a trauma of holiness that we all, I think, must experience. What do I mean by that? Well, according to R.C., he says that when human beings encounter and experience the holiness of God, the testimony of Scripture, and this is also according to uh, the reformer John Calvin, is that they universally or uniformly are filled with a holy fear or a holy dread and they tremble in the presence of God. If we remember the Israelites who approached Mount Sinai, After wandering through the desert, they beseech Moses to speak to God for them as they are too afraid to even approach the mountain in which God is thundering from. And the scripture says that actually this pleased the Lord. Look at what Habakkuk says. If you remember one of the stories of Habakkuk, he says, He was angry at God because he is seeing all the injustice and evil that's happening in his homeland. And Habakkuk thinks that God's not doing enough about it. So he goes up to his watchtower and he says, I'm going to stay here until God answers my complaint. He says to God, you are of pure eyes and can even look upon sin, but here you are. He says, how can you stand by and let all of this evil happen in Israel and do nothing about it? You seem to be blind to it. But when God finally does appear to Habakkuk, we need to remember Habakkuk's response. Habakkuk 3.2 and 3.16 says this, O Lord, I have heard your speech and was what afraid when I heard he said my body trembled my lips quivered at your voice and he says this rottenness entered my bones and I trembled within myself Habakkuk's response should remind us of a couple other Bible stories first when King David is confronted by the prophet Nathan about his sin with Bathsheba, he writes two psalms, Psalm 32 and Psalm 51. In Psalm 32, David says that when he was silent about his sin, and he says, God, your hand was heavy upon me, he said he felt like his bones within him were wasting away. Also remember Job. And I talked a little bit about Job last week. Remember that after he was complaining about God and then 
God finally appears to him. Here's what Job says. And first, this is God speaking. He says, shall the one who contends with Almighty, the Almighty correct him? Hmm? You trying to correct me? Habakkuk, are you trying to correct me? Job, are you now trying to correct me? He who rebukes God, let him answer it. And then Job, he says, when the Lord appears to him, answered the Lord and said, and read this with me, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yes, twice I said some things, but I will proceed no further. When God appears, all of Job's theories and complaints about the injustice of God vanish. Not because God gives him a logical and convincing answer, but because the God who created the universe is so far above Job and he appears to Job that Job's complaints suddenly seem actually unclean. I'm not saying we can't have legitimate discussions with God about things we don't understand, but we must approach this God not in an accusatory tone. I am vile, Job states. And yet we know from the book of Job that as far as human righteousness goes, according to God himself, Job is the most righteous man around. That's why God points him out to Satan. Look at my servant Job. Look at how good he is. Yet in God's presence, Job, like I want you to picture that Job lays his hand over his mouth. He covers his mouth. I'm not going to talk at all anymore. The idea of covering our mouths is connected to what Scripture calls the sinfulness of our tongues. As Jesus said, we are not defiled by what goes into our mouths, as so many of the Pharisees have thought, but by what comes out of our mouths. And what comes out of our mouths reveals what is truly in our hearts, according to Jesus. And the Scripture tells us our mouths are often, as James, the Apostle, puts it, a restless evil. Full, he, and, and, full of deadly poison. In God's presence, Job's impulse is to cover his mouth, to just stop talking. For R.C. Sproul, there is no more important text to help us understand the holiness of God and our response to that holiness as Isaiah chapter 6 verses 1 to 7. So we're going to look at this and unpack it together this morning. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one cried to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And the whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. And so I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal which he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged, or other 
translations say your sin has been atoned for. The year that King Uzziah died. Now King Uzziah was a beloved king in Judah. As you know, most of the kings in both Israel and Judah would be more like a rogues gallery, a gallery of rogues, than a gallery of righteousness or a hall of fame or righteousness. The kings of Israel most often did not seek to live out the law of God as they were commanded to. From time to time there were righteous kings. Uh, David obviously, his son Solomon started off pretty well, but ended poorly most believe he we have kings like Jehoshaphat we have kings like Hezekiah uh, Josiah a few others that were good but most of the kings kings like Ahaz and others led both Israel and Judah into apostasy into idolatry it was a cycle within the history of Israel now Uzziah started out as a very good king, uh, he was kind of maybe in the top five of kings. His first 16 years of his reign, it talks all about how much God blessed him for his obedience to God. There was all kinds of restoring of land and everything that happened under Uzziah. But at the end of his reign, it's kind of like a Shakespearean tragedy. Uh, things go bad for him. The end of his reign, he is filled with pride. And he decided he did not need to follow God's laws regarding the, regarding the priesthood. He wanted to offer incense to God himself instead of having the priests and the, in the lineage of Aaron do that. And because of this, God struck him, it says, with leprosy. And he lived out the end of his life in seclusion. He had to appoint his son Jotham to rule, to be his co-regent, and he would uh, rule in seclusion. He, he, he was, um, had to stay away from everyone because of his leprosy. But before this incident happens, he is actually a very good king. And so it says in the year that King Uzziah died, and so his death would have been a time of national mourning, uh, certainly some uncertainty. And it is in that backdrop that King is dead, that Isaiah has his vision of the Lord sitting on his throne, on the throne. Now the word the Lord here is not capitalized, and as I've taught you there's a different words, Hebrew words for Lord in the text. And so an, an uncapitalized Lord in the Old Testament means it is the Hebrew word for Adonai. If it's capitalized, it means the divine name Yahweh. If it's not capitalized, it usually means the, the term Adonai, which means the sovereign one or the king. And this is significant because the year Uzziah dies is causing a time of mourning and uncertainty as a nation, but then God gives Isaiah a vision of who the true king is sitting on the throne. It is a picture in the sense of God's promise to rule over Israel, that he will guide them. It's a picture of comfort. And, I is, and Isaiah says that when he's seeing this vision, the king's train of his robe fills the temple. And in the ancient world, the length and splendor of the king's robe signified his power. It signified his greatness. And the train of God's royal robes doesn't just come down the steps of the throne, but it swirls around and fills the whole temple. Above the throne, it says, are seraphim, who are these beings that have six wings. Think about that. Two wings, it says, cover their faces. And 
It, part of that is this picture of it's covering their eyes because the brilliance and the glory of God is so much that if you look upon God in his glory, you will die. And so the pictures of these beings covering their faces, but possibly even covering their mouths with the two wings. The other wings cover their feet, and that should bring to our mind Moses and Joshua, who had to remove their sandals, because the very ground is holy where God is present. And so the seraphim cover their feet in God's presence. The final two wings they use to fly above the throne. And in this vision they are singing to one another. They are repeating over and over, crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And the whole earth is full of His glory. Imagine this seen this is you now your Isaiah you're seeing all of this and the seraphim are singing back and forth it says one to the other holy 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 is the Lord of hosts the whole earth is full of his glory and the Lord in this sense me is is capitalized which means again the divine name it is Yahweh who is on the throne. Yahweh is our Adonai. Yahweh is our King. And above all else, according to the seraphim, He is what? Holy. Now in the English language, if we want to emphasize something in writing, we can use adjectives or adverbs like very. Would be one of those terms. God is not just holy, but he is very holy, we might say. Or if you're reading it, you might underline it, or you might put it in bold. If you looked at my my sermon, there's lots of bolding of things and underlining that I do to emphasize things. But in the ancient world, <clears throat> when they wrote, in order to emphasize, they would double up. They would say something over again. They would say it a multiple of times. It's a repeating of the same word or the same phrase to emphasize it. For instance, we will say amen at the end of a prayer as a way of emphasizing our desires for his fulfillment. Amen seems, means so be it in a sense, Lord. May it be so. Uh, but Jesus actually often started a prayer with the word amen. Did you know that? He would begin his prayer with amen. Amen, amen, I say unto thee. Or, other translations say, truly, truly, I say unto thee. And it was a way of saying, what I'm going to say right now is very important. You should turn your phones off. You should stop looking at Facebook, and you should listen. It's kind of like if you're on a ship, and you are in a storm, and it's rocking and reeling around, and over the intercom, intercom you hear this voice saying, Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking, and that means you should stop whatever you're doing and listen. Paul in Galatians 1 says this, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one that we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. The Greek word for accursed is Anathema, which means to be damned. Paul you, says this twice for emphasis. And what he's basically saying is even, I want you to think about this, even if an angel, for goodness sake, comes down into your church, there he is with all of his wings flapping around and he is a, in brilliant glory and he begins to preach to you a gospel contrary to the one that I have preached to you what I want you to do is take him by his angelic garb and kick him out of the church 
and call him accursed or damned. But he says it twice. He repeats it twice for emphasis. And in the scripture, we'll see lots of this doubling down of words to emphasize a point or to make us think this is very important, this is something we need to really pay attention to. And they'll often do it twice. Verily, verily, truly, truly. But very rarely do you see what they call the tripling up of a word. The trifecta of a word or phrase for emphasis. And what the scholars say this means is it's kind of like if you went holy then you went holier, and then you went holiest. If you go three, that means like this is the infinite level of whatever they're speaking about. And we ought to ponder that when we read this text in Isaiah 6. The Bible is clear that God is love, and, and I think it's it's a critical understanding of the nature of God. But we never see anywhere in the text that it says, love, love, love is the Lord. Don't get me wrong. I'm saying that God is love. The scripture says that God is life. But never in the text does it say life, life, life is the Lord. Instead, more often than not, we read holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The whole earth is full of His glory. Above all other attributes of God, holiness is the one that is being repeated and sung over the throne of heaven for all of eternity. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And when Isaiah sees this, it's, he says the whole foundations of the doorway of everything that he's seeing in the temple begins to shake. So imagine that. The temple is shaking. And suddenly it is full of smoke. It says the whole place fills with smoke. And that should make us think about the desert. And, the, and as they were traveling through the desert, the Israelites, they followed what? They followed the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. The presence of and the majesty of the Lord was ahead of them. And now he's sitting there and the smoke fills the temple. And, and this is what they wanted. They always wanted the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem to be filled with the holiness, with the presence of God. And so he's sitting there and smoke fills the temple and at this moment, and especially if we look at the King James Version, as Isaiah sees all of this, all that he can say is, Woe! Woe is me! Woe is me! I am undone. And, and the term for that is almost like, I, I am disintegrated. I am torn apart. I am completely undone. Now many translations, if you go to them now, they'll try and change those words because nobody talks that way anymore. We never, none of us say, woe is me. If something happens, it's kind of like using old English terms, you know, like thus or so on. Newer translations say things like, uh, they'll translate this, it's all over, one of them said, or I'm ruined, another translation says. 
But that's a little unfortunate because like many terms that we read in the Bible, the term that that is in the Hebrew is important. It's like a little hidden theological gem that if we just change the word, we lose its significance. And this is one of those times. The term woe is a prophetic term. To understand this, we have to understand the difference between priests and prophets. A prophet of God was different from the priest in this way. The priest's job was to speak for the people to God. Did you get that? But the prophet's job was to speak for God to the people. So the prophet in the Old Testament never prefaced his words with things like, in my humble opinion, or as best as I can guess, this is what the Lord wants. Instead, they would say, and you know the term, thus saith the Lord. Now I would say to you in the New Testament, uh, we're not supposed to be that precise, I'll talk, that, but that's a different sermon. But in the Old Testament, the prophet, this was the terminology they used. They were God's mouthpiece for the people. They understood that they were vessels of divine announcement. And the literary form that was used by the prophets of Israel was called the oracle. They would be like an oracle. Remember in... in um, the Greek world, there was the Oracle of Delphi and other ones, and the oracles would always tell them the future in a sense. They would speak whether God, the gods were with them or against them, and this is very much the way that the prophets of Israel also functioned. And the pronouncements or the oracles came in one of two forms. There was either a pronouncement of wheel or blessing. So wheel means blessing. So an oracle or a prophet in the Old Testament would either give a pronouncement of blessings if God was happy with them, if things were going good, or they would give a pronouncement of woe. You following me? So the Jewish oracles gave pronouncements of weal, and the word they would use is blessed. Or they would give oracles of bad news using the term woe. Jesus uses these terms in his own ministry. Remember when he's preaching the Sermon on the Mount, what does he start with? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the peacemakers. And also, conversely, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Now, here I am, right. Now, as a prophet of Yahweh, Isaiah would speak oracles of woe to nations, or he might speak it to Israel if God was telling him that he was angry or punishing them. But here Isaiah, when he sees this image, when he sees this vision, he can only utter, woe is me. He actually is uttering a oracle of woe upon himself. And again, look at the instrument of his sin is what? His mouth. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Now Isaiah, as far as people of that time and place are concerned, would have been a pretty righteous man. I don't think there would have been anyone as righteous as Isaiah. He is... God's prophet. Out of his mouth are the things that God is wanting his people to hear. He is God's mouthpiece. 
but he calls himself a man with a filthy mouth. I, my mouth is unclean. And that means not just that his mouth is unclean, but it means that his heart is unclean. And But I would say this to you. Why does he think that about himself? You know, up until this point in time, he's, he, he, he thought he was pretty good. He, he's, he's the mouthpiece for God. He's a pretty righteous person. He's used to telling Ahaz and other kings what they're doing wrong. But in this moment, at this time, suddenly... I am a man of unclean lips. Why? He, he answers it in the text, because I have seen the Lord. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. That, that seeing that revelation, that vision is what changes his perspective about his own righteousness. I thought I was a somebody, but then I saw the Lord. And I realized that my mouth, my mouth doesn't have a clue. Actually, it kind of spews out unclean things all the time. Like Job, Isaiah figuratively places his hand over his mouth. Anything I say at this moment, short of worship, short of holy, holy, holy is the Lord, heaven and earth are full of His glory, is going to seem empty and irrelevant. This revelation is emphasized by Jesus himself in his ministry. He says this in Matthew 12, 36 and 37. But I say to you that every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. And I thought to myself when I read that, every idle word? What? What does that mean? Every foolish and idly spoken thing I've ever said? And forgive my coarseness, but you mean every time I BS my way through a conversation? Every time I want to look smart and just say whatever comes to my mind and think it's authoritative. Every time I gossip even just a little bit to make the story seem a little bit juicier. Every time I use the Lord's name in vain. Well, we all know that's wrong, but it happens still. Every time I tell a questionable joke. Every time I embellish a story to make myself look a little bit better. Every idle word, Lord? See, the problem, church, is we judge ourselves by ourselves, or more accurately, by what we think of other people. Compared to you guys, and I'm not saying this, I don't know you, but compared to you guys, I'm not that bad. You guys probably speak idle words, you probably gossip, you have probably lied. Compared to some of you, I'm doing pretty good. Compared to most of the people in Judah and Israel, Isaiah was doing pretty good. Compared to the most of the people around Job, he was doing pretty good. But the problem is we are not to compare ourselves to ourselves or to other people as our standard for holiness. We are to compare ourselves to God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Be holy, even as I am holy. Be perfect, even as God is perfect. Jesus tells us that on the Sermon on the Mount. 
And that's one reason that we need a revelation, church, of the holiness of God is because we cannot and we will not understand our need of grace until we get a divine revelation of His holiness. Till we get a glimpse of His perfection and purity, a stark and somewhat church traumatic revelation of the gaping expanse that exists between the greatness of God and the smallness of humanity. Think of Peter for a moment. Church, he's in the boat after Jesus fills his net with fish. And we read this in Luke 5, 8. When Simon Peter saw it, saw the catch, it says he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. If you remember the story, Peter had fished all day. He was a good fisherman too. I can imagine what he thought when Jesus told him to go back out there. After he had finished cleaning and putting his nets away, they were cleaning the nets and finished packing them up. When Jesus took his boat, he took Peter's boat, he went out and began to preach to the people from Peter's boat. And then almost as an ob object lesson, at the end he tells Peter, hey Peter, you know, let's go back out fishing. And Peter probably thought, yeah, right. You holy men always think you know everything. You preachers are all the same. Then when Jesus tells him, okay, you know, we're out a little bit further. He says, okay, put your nets down here. And Peter probably thought, we're doing this all night and I know when we're supposed to fish and it's not in the middle of the day. But he says, because you say to do it, I'll do it. And the way the text puts it is, it is almost instantaneous. This is no ordinary fishing trip. They do not spend a lazy afternoon fishing and then realize at the end of it, oh, we did get a good catch. Gee, Jesus was right. We should just go and persevere and get a few more fish. That's not what happened. No, at that moment that he lowered his nets, it was like every fish in the Sea of Galilee came over to the boat and jumped into their net. It says immediately the nets were strained to their breaking point. Peter had to call James and John and Simon and his, his relatives and both boats had to go over there and they had to try and stop the nets from, from breaking and immediately those nets were filled and then they pull, they, they, they get the catch in but it says that it fills both boats so full that both boats are on the brink of sinking. I imagine that for Peter and the disciples who were in those boats, it, it would feel similar to another time when the disciples were in a boat crossing the Sea of Galilee. A terrible storm whips up. Jesus is sleeping in the boat. The disciples think that they're going to die. They wake Jesus up and they accuse him of not even caring. You don't even care about us. You don't even care if we die. And Jesus, he doesn't address their accusations. Instead, he stands up in the boat and simply speaks to the wind and the waves. Peace, be still. He commands them. And suddenly, instantaneously, as his words leave his lips, can you imagine it? Silence. No wind. No waves, possibly not even a ripple on the water. How would you feel if you were in that boat? And it says in Mark 4, 
they were all filled with great fear and said to one another, Who in the world is this in the boat with us? That even the winds and the sea obey him. Who is this man in the boat with me? That is what Peter might have thought when he looked at the miraculous catch. Who is this man who commands the fish to come over to my boat and jump into my net? And not only that, but they obey his command. And what it does to Peter is immediately he feels like he cannot be in his presence. Depart from me Leave me, Lord, I'm afraid to be around you. Why? For I am a sinful man. I am a sinful man. This is what R.C. Sproul calls the trauma of holiness. When we are confronted with the holiness of God, we become uncomfortable. The thought of an all-holy God is traumatic to a sinful world. Look what happens to Isaiah. When Isaiah says he is a man of unclean lips, God does not say to him, Hey, Isaiah, don't overreact. You're okay. It's all right. You're not that bad. You're pretty good. No, no, you're way better than most, Isaiah. He doesn't say that. God agrees with Isaiah's assessment of his situation. But, this all-holy God has a solution. God tells an angel to go take a white-hot coal off the altar. And I want you to picture this. The, he uses tongs. Why? Because this coal is so hot that if he touches it, it will burn even the angel's fingers. And he is told to touch Isaiah's lips with the hot coal. We need to remember something. Your lips are one of the most sensitive parts of your body. That's why we like to kiss. This is a picture of both purification and pain. God is cauterizing the lips of Isaiah. Now, I don't know if this literally happened or if it was all in a dream or a vision, but it is meant to make you squirm. Cauterizing his lips in order to cleanse his lips, and it says atone for his sin. But think of how painful that imagery is. Blistering, burning lips. I want you to just have that thought as you go eat lunch later on. It is, church, a picture in a sense of the cross. It is a foreshadowing of the cross. Our sin separates us from an all-holy God. We need God to cleanse us. We need God to purge us from our sin, to bridge the enormous gap that exists between us and Him. But it is not a pain-free event. Our sin has a cost. But the goodness, or the good news is this, that the same church holy God who commands the sea, the same One who commands the waves, who commands the fish, the same God who is the true King, whose train fills the temple, the same God of which the seraphim continually sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. That God has come down and He has taken upon Himself the cost. He has taken upon Himself the pain. He has taken upon Himself the punishment for all of your sins. The coal that touched Isaiah's lips was taken from the altar of sacrifice. And in one sense, Jesus took both took the burning coal upon himself. In other words, it was touched to his lips, but by touching his lips, you were cleansed. 
Not only that, but then he touches us. He took the pain and we receive the atonement. But there is still some pain that we must endure if we are to receive this gift, this cleansing. And I would call it the trauma of the cross. The cross is an offense. It is a stumbling block to those who are perishing. There is a tendency in sinful humanity to fight against the picture of an all-holy God. We even hate the holiness of God we deny the holiness of God. The pain that we must endure if we are to be cleansed is to believe and agree with God. We must see the gap. We must see God's holiness. We must see our sinfulness. We need a revelation church of this it is that revelation that drives us to our knees and to the cross and then we must submit to God's remedy and I just end it with this God's remedy is the white hot coal of the cross So let's end there.